zeal, just to use it more like to give God control is disobedience. The disobedient servant is the one who says, I'll wait until God, until the master comes and tells me what to do. And that's disobedience. Letting God tell you what to do is disobedience. Letting God take control of your life is disobedience. Because a steward has been given control of those talents and has responsible decisions to make. Right? Stewards make responsible decisions. Right? Respons responsible is the same as accountable, and accountable is, comes from the word account. A steward has to give an account of his stewardship. Right? He has to give an account. He has to say, and we've got that scene at the end of the parable of, of, of the talents, right? Lord, look what I've done. I've invested my five talents, I've made five more. That's giving an account. Right, go ahead. And so the steward, though, while the master is away, is mm -hmm. going to try and manage his affairs in the way that the master would want him to, correct? You bet. And it's so, clear that, 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 that you're supposed to make the talents grow. Right. And so in, he's discerning how the master would want him to, to be responsible. Okay. So although the master's not back yet, he is, in a sense, yielding <laughs> his own control to what his master would want him to do. Okay. He's discerning, that's for sure. That's, go ahead. But he's doing it by, well, I mean, it can be taken the parable, but he's doing it by looking at a written instruction sheet. It may not cover every specific situation in detail, but gives general guidelines. Like, okay. yeah, here's the issue, right? Does the master tell the steward what decisions to make? Mm -hmm. The answer is quite clearly no. Right? The master wants the steward to invest the talents and make money. Right? That is, it's, it's clear our Lord wants us to invest our talents in, in the growth of the kingdom. Right? The particular decisions to make, we must make ourselves. And that's essential. That's not a, 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 a side issue. We do not discern what the Master wants. That's the wrong way to make decisions. We discern. It goes back to Solomon. Let's go back to Solomon. Solomon prays. Right? He, he's a steward of the whole kingdom. Right? He's, he's David's son. And he's saying, Lord, I'm just, I'm just a child. I don't know how to go in or go out. And I'm, I'm king over your people, Israel. Please give me an understanding heart to discern. What is it discern? Not your will. Put in bed. That's what he asks to discern. He does not ask to discern God's will. He asks to discern good and bad. There's a very definite reason why. He wants wisdom. Wisdom is fundamentally the ability to discern between good and bad. Mm -hmm. If you're a steward, for instance, making investments, a wise investor can discern between good investments and bad investments. That's what wisdom is in investment. God wants you to become wise. You can't do that if he makes the decisions. Therefore, that's why it's disobedient for you to try to get God to make, to make the decisions. God wants you to make to learn how to make good decisions yourself because he wants his children to be wise. And that's why Solomon prayed that way. Yes. But the good the good in our own lives uh, is the will of God, isn't it? Sure. God wants us to do good and not bad. But this is the way to ask the question. The question is about what we're shifting to is the question of what's, what Aristotle called deliberation. How do you decide what to do? Right? That's what deliberation is, deciding what to do. Now, deliberation is the form of inquiry, as Aristotle points out. Right? So it's, a, it's a based on questions. We ask, what should we do? Right? What's the question to ask? That's the question to ask. What's the good thing to do here? What's the best thing to do here? In other words, if you ask, what's God's will in this situation, and you aren't asking about obedience to the revealed will of God, right, then you're asking the wrong question. And that's important. You need to learn what a good investment is and how that's different from a bad investment. You need to learn that. To ask what's God's will here is asking the wrong question to learn what you need to learn in order to have wisdom. And that's important. It's your job to learn how to distinguish good from bad. Go ahead. Um, if we're not supposed to listen to God's voice, yeah. um, how do we reinterpret, or how do we, how do we understand prayer? Um, uh -huh. I think a lot of times uh, we see prayer as an exercise of talking, but also of listening. You bet. And if we're not, if we're not to do that, if we're not to listen to God's voice in ourselves. Is prayer still a tool to discern good from bad, to discern mm. God's mm -hmm. will? That, is that a tool we should use for that purpose, or is it not really, does it not really touch that part of it? 
Okay. Um, all right, I think we said enough about this. Okay, maybe enough about that. Um, prayer. Um, prayer is not just a private event, right? Um, the hearing of the Word of God happens most fundamentally in the community of the faithful, in the body of Christ. So, um, the dialogue between us and God is a dialogue that happens within a community. If you think of it entirely about yourself alone in prayer, you'll end up sort of getting stuck on the wrong questions, I think. Right? Um, so you ask, um, well, Paul says, Paul, in two of his letters he has these wonderful parallels. On the one he says, um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's uh, Colossians. In Ephesians he says, be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. To be filled with the Spirit is to let the Word of Christ dwell in you. That's, that's the same thing. Right? When the Spirit is filling you, it's because you, plural, it's, a, it's all in the plural, by the way, it's you, plural, like you all, you guys, let the Word of Christ dwell among you in this community so that you teach and admonish one another about the Word of Christ. There's how you hear God's Word. And that's also how you learn wisdom and also how He speaks to us. Is when the Word of Christ is not just words on a page, the words in a liturgy, in prayer, and in celebration, and also in music. Uh, that's that's God speaking to us in the body of Christ. Yes? It just occurred to me that perhaps this whole bad theology was the result of the individualization of Christianity. What do you think about that? I, I don't know if it's a result, but it, it, it takes the form of a certain kind of individualism. Yeah. Because you, you think of yourself as if your prayer is just you and God. Right? Well, there is forms of prayer that is just you and God. But there's the body of Christ, too. Right? And if you want a dialogue, you need another person. One of the fundamental things about... Oh, one of the reasons why I don't think that God speaks in our heart is because God speaks as a person. Any voice that's in your heart is your own, not some other person's. Other people speak to us from outside of our own hearts. That's, what's make them, that's what makes them other, right? So, the people, it, it's, I think it's completely backwards to say that God speaking in our heart is personal. It's impersonal, because other persons speak outside our hearts. This is why we need the body of Christ. This is why we need this community, right? Because the body of Christ is the continuation of the bodily presence of Christ himself, who comes to us from outside our hearts. But then there's, of course, ways that, that what is outside of us can come into us. Yes? Oh, oh. Okay, well, I think in prayer also requires, not, not by individual, but like alone, too, because he says go into the room, right. lock the door. Right? That, too. Right. That's so it's not too. just, not just alone. But he never said that, that go into your closet alone and listen to, to what God says to you. But, but it's, not just, it's not just in the community. Sure, it's not just in the community. On the other hand, you're not going to pray well in your closet unless you're part of the body of Christ. So yes, indeed, there is a private dimension, but that's not the only dimension. And the problem with individualism is you think of, the, of your private prayer as if that's what it's all about. Right? Um, and, and that's that's a mistake. Um, yeah. So how should private prayer work then? Because I'm hearing you say a lot about what it's not supposed to be, which ah. leaves me kind of going, what do I do now? Well, um, you learn the Lord's Prayer, you learn the Ten Commandments. Um, Luther, for instance, would, would begin his private prayer with the uh, Lord's Prayer and Ten Commandments uh, every time. Um, pray the Psalms. Learn to pray the Psalms. Good stuff. Good, uh, it feeds the heart. Right? And you know it's God's Word. Right? Um, oh, and uh, then the question is, what about the thoughts that arise in prayer? Let me give you another... I wasn't planning to talk about this one, but this is actually an important way to get at. Think about intuitions. Right. Uh, what we mean by intuitions nowadays is different from what it used to mean, but let's talk about that. Intuitions of your heart. Right. Intuitions means, nowadays, you know, a thought comes to your heart, you don't know where it comes from. Right. Uh, you say, I can't explain where it came from. It just came. 